Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm my name is Jean Becker. I am a development manager in the advancement department of the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And we're thrilled to have you joining us this afternoon uh, for this presentation on ancestral Pueblo turkey husbandry. Um, we would like to go thank a few um, uh, very um, important organizations that help support the webinars, the Colorado Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Region 9 um, Economic Development District of Colorado. Um, and of course, we also want to give a big thank you to all of you, because as the development manager, I am the one who processes all of your donations that help support these webinars, and we certainly couldn't do it without your help. So um, I do really appreciate and all of the Crow Canyon staff appreciates um, the support that we're receiving from the viewers of these webinars. Um, and uh, some of you are new. And so there's just a couple of suggestions and guidelines we have. If um, any one of our faces is in the way, you can just uh, click on the, the head, the talking head, and move it to wherever you want on your screen. I keep my heads up in my upper right-hand corner so that they don't block your the presentation. Um, we do ask that if you have questions, um, that you put them in the Q&A. Uh, please don't put them in the chat because it's much more difficult for us to monitor the questions there. And so whatever questions you have, uh, put them in the Q&A. And um, Dr. Conrad has requested that all questions be held until the end of his presentation. So we will get to the questions, um, but that will be after his presentations, his presentation. Um, if you have any difficulties, technical difficulties, you can go directly to our Facebook page and Taylor will be there to help um, resolve your technical. Or if you have a technical question, you can put that in the chat and Taylor will get back to you. Um, and finally, we really encourage you to join our YouTube channel. Um, it not only is a great place for you to find out information about upcoming webinars, um, to view previous webinars, um, I did want to say that this is the 44th webinar that um, Crow Canyon has sponsored since we started this series at the beginning of last year. And I think when we did our first webinar in January of 2020, we had no idea that they would become so popular and that we would get a worldwide audience that is watching these webinars. So this is webinar number 44, and we will have them continue throughout this entire year. Um, our, the mission of the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And you can find out more about our organization at crowcanyon.org. Uh, we also want to um, acknowledge and the Pueblo, Ute, Diné, uh, Jacarilla, Apache, and Paiute people on whose traditional homelands we work and reside. We are grateful to all indigenous people who continue to preserve and protect cultural traditions, maintain ancestral relationships, and steward these lands. The work at Crow Canyon would not be possible without recognizing and honoring the many generations of people whom we learn from every day. As I said before, we have webinars every Thursday at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. The next two webinars um, are listed here on February 4th. We have Dr. Eric Robinson uh, talking about the macro history of human demography in the pre-Hispanic greater Southwest. And on February 11th, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Tim Kohler, who is a member, a trustee on the Crow Canyon uh, Board of Directors. And he will be talking about thinking like an archeologist. 
So both of these promise to be very interesting presentations, and I urge you to register for them. Many of you have expressed an interest in knowing more about how to help uh, the Native partners who are really, really struggling um, during this COVID period. Um, the devastation that some of them have faced is, is heartbreaking. So these are four um, organizations that um, we direct you to if you would like to make a financial donation. Um, and you can find this information on our YouTube page uh, later in the evening after we've posted today's lecture, if you don't have time to write it all down. Um, but any one of these would be very um, uh, welcoming of any financial support you can give them, because like I say, it's a real challenging time for them. So now we're ready to start the webinar. And I would like to introduce Dr. Siler Conrad. Um, who is an archaeologist and a tribal technical liaison at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And he's also an adjunct, associate, adjunct assistant professor of archaeology at the University of New Mexico. His current research focuses on understanding human-animal relationships in a variety of temporal periods and contexts, including the American Southwest, Mexican Northwest, 19th century, 19th century California, and the Pleistocene, Holocene, mainland Southeast Asia. Dr. Conrad has experience working in New Mexico, California, Thailand, and Laos. And he is the author or co-author of over 20 peer-reviewed papers and or book chapters, and has received funding from the National Science Foundation and the National Geographic Society among others. So we're very thrilled today to welcome Siler Conrad. And like I say, I'll be back uh, to help monitor the questions at the end of your presentation. So welcome, Siler. Thank you, Jean and Taylor. I really appreciate it. Let me share my screen here. I feel as though I should be thanking all of you uh, for letting me chat for the next 40 minutes or so about turkeys, one of my favorite things to do. Okay, let's make sure this works here. I hope everyone can see this. I'm going to assume yes, unless I hear anything else. So today, whoops, I'm very excited to talk to everyone about pinning, turkey pinning, and specifically the relationship between ancestral Pueblo management of turkeys and how this relates to sort of broader characteristics about how turkeys integrated into past Pueblo society and how we can identify this on the landscape. And I'm gonna be using an example, really a case study uh, from the Pavito Plateau uh, in sort of the Northern Rio Grande of Northern New Mexico. So let's continue here. I wanna talk a little bit about the ethnographic and ethno-historic record of pinning in the Southwest. I think this is quite important. Uh, and then I'm also gonna talk a little bit about archeological examples, what we know about turkey pins. And then the critical part, why pinning matters. Uh, why is there such a focus on turkey pins, at least for this talk and sort of uh, in my mind, uh, and why this matters for the, the greater Southwest and, and Mexican Northwest and understanding exactly how these processes, especially this human-turkey relationship, uh, unfolded through time. And then finally, I want to talk about this case study from the Pajarito Plateau. This is from LA4618. This is an archaeological site uh, that's located at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And, and try to contextualize this evidence of turkey pinning and what this means for uh, sort of broader uh, uh, human-turkey interactions in this region. Okay, next slide here. So the ethnographic and the ethno-historic record in the, uh, this, the Southwest uh, is quite intriguing. When you think about uh, the pinning and the captivity of animals, uh, this is a historic photograph from 1903. This is from Zuni Pueblo. You can see here just this wonderful little turkey hanging out. Uh, the the caption, the description was uh, sort of these walled in gardens with turkeys and these fields. And what's important here is that if you take a look and you read through some of these early, uh, either Spanish or, or later Euro-American uh, anthropological accounts of uh, Pueblo captivity of turkeys, what you find is that the birds were really kept in a, uh, a sort of corralled sense, but they were really allowed to free range. And so their descriptions, they're described a lot uh, in the same way as sheep, kind of this pastoralism, 
uh, sort of process in which turkeys were allowed to, to free range during the day. They were allowed to consume foods outside of Pueblo villages. And then in the evenings at night, they were kept sometimes in these types of corrals or, or in other sorts of uh, features. Uh, they were kept within villages or nearby villages at night. And, and this is a, a, a really interesting idea because it shows up in this post-contact record uh, quite extensively, especially in descriptions of how turkeys were being kept. Uh, and yet, uh, what I'll talk about here in a little bit, there's an interesting long-term similarity and sort of trajectory in how we can understand ancestral Pueblo uh, painting of turkeys with this in mind. And so again, this is a, a drawing talking about an animal corral for uh, sheep, horse, uh, also uh, donkeys. Uh, this is again from Zuni Pueblo. Talks about this very uh, sort of uh, um, uh, straightforward construction using wooden posts, sticks, uh, they're tied or, or, or uh, latched together. Uh, often there are some stones or, or other types of items here that are sort of used to brace this fence. And this is a, a really generalized construction that is used to, to keep these domesticated animals when they're not allowed to sort of range during the day. Uh, it's interesting because this description and this drawing from Zuni Pueblo, and, and again, this that photo I just showed, uh, they're not specific to turkeys. They're not they're not talking about the keeping or the painting of turkeys. They're really talking about these introduced to Spanish domesticated animals. And yet there's a lot of similarities when we look back in time. And so if you take a look at the archeological record and I have Bill Leip to thank for this, I, this is a photo of this type of pin that comes from the quintessential turkey pin site uh, in south, the southeastern Utah, uh, outside of Grand Gulch. This is really interesting because you see, again, if you think about these, ethno-historic, ethnographic accounts from Zuni Pueblo that I just showed, you have the same type of design, the same type of structure that's being uh, essentially used here. Uh, and the idea, at least for this structure, is that it was used perhaps as a turkey pen, but likely for a small number of birds, perhaps just a single bird. And I, uh, I think that uh, uh, if you talk to Bill, uh, you know, this is a, uh, it, it's an interesting site because the turkey deposits a turkey pen. There are a lot of droppings. They show up abundantly in the shelter. Uh, and they date very early, 1,800 years ago, 2,000 years ago. This is very, very early evidence for turkeys. But this structure itself with this generalized sort of wooden uh, um, architecture, I suppose, you can also see the mud that's encasing uh, these sticks through these posts. Uh, this seems to be common, and, and this is probably dating much later in time, perhaps Pueblo two or three, so we're talking sometime after AD 900. But again, it's very it's very intriguing to me to see this type of photo of a structure that's probably being used to, to pin turkeys, to keep turkeys captive and enclosed. And then thinking again about this, uh, this historic and ethnographic account and sort of record where you see the same type of construction occurring. So I wanted to uh, sort of use this as this first archaeological example. But if you dive into the archaeological record, you will find numerous examples of turkey pins. And it's rather exciting, uh, especially if you don't mind reading about turkey dung and droppings, because Turkey droppings are really the key identifier uh, for whether or not you have a turkey pin. And so this is one of my favorite sites. This is Pindi Pueblo. Uh, you can see here these wooden posts that they discovered in the plaza of this Pueblo village. Uh, this, uh, this village dates to about 80, late 1200s, 1300s. Um, you can see here, though, this construction of wooden posts. They were probably encased in mud. Uh, and I'm actually going to show another, another image here which is that photograph you just saw was essentially standing somewhere right here, looking down towards these pins. And so you can see this construction, at least in this case, again, of pins, you know, within the plaza using the natural uh, sort of enclosure of the plaza itself, this human constructed space. Uh, and they use this to construct these pins uh, to then keep turkeys, keep birds. And there's a lot of turkey droppings, uh, probably little fragmented portions of turkey watering bowls. It's a very, very interesting site and assemblage. We can also look at other contexts. So this is quite early. We're talking about 8600s here. This is in Northeast Arizona. Uh, fascinating photos. I love these. This is Earl Morris's work in the 1930s. This is at Broken Flute Cave. What I wanted to point out here, uh, you see this sort of circular shape. This is a pit house structure that they're excavating. They talk about this burnt layer that they identified uh, as they were working down through these sediments. This burnt layer really capped the human occupation of the structure. The structure burned, it was abandoned, and then it was reused as a turkey pen. And what they identified is that all of these sediments on top of this burnt layer were just chock full of turkey droppings and other vegetation. Uh, 
And I can show you another photo right here. Uh, this is sort of a little bit later in the excavation. You can see some of the roof beams here are burnt. But again, this dense layer of vegetation, uh, apparently this was just full of turkey droppings. So again, another uh, sort of form of a turkey pin that shows up in the southwest. You have the same, the same line of evidence in the sense of turkey droppings, turkey dung that's showing up, uh, and they're in these enclosed spaces. It's, it's quite interesting. Okay, another site, and this will become important when we talk about the Paw Plateau. Uh, this is Ceremonial Cave, also known as Alcove House and Bandelier National Monument. I wanted to mention this really quickly. This site was excavated in the early 1900s by Hewitt, uh, Edgar Hewitt and, and other folks. In the 1930s, there was a, a historic buildings report essentially uh, written on this site and they documented the presence of possible uh, turkey pins along the backside of the cave. Uh, also, uh, after the Kiva was abandoned, that this was likely used as a turkey pin. And this was, again, based on the presence of turkey droppings uh, and also eggshell fragments and other types of other types of evidence. And when you think about turkey droppings and sort of identifying pins within this archaeological record, this is a key photo. Uh, this is from Sapawinge Pueblo, Sapawe Pueblo. Uh, this is one of the rooms at this ancestral village site. And hopefully you can tell that there is a yellow sedimentary layer right here, this sort of yellow deposit. This is essentially a, a mat of turkey droppings and turkey dung. Uh, so this is really uh, sort of classic evidence for when folks are talking about identifying turkey, uh, turkey pins in the archaeological record. They're really looking for these dung deposits. And often in ancestral villages, we see this evidence for reuse of rooms that were already constructed. Uh, they had a, a, a purpose, they had a use, uh, but then they were reused as turkey pins. Uh, we also see, again, this construction and, and use of a, a lot of different spaces uh, to keep turkeys. And it really speaks to their importance, I think, uh, in the ancestral public world. And we'll come back to that. But I, I like this photograph from Sapawe because it really highlights you know, what you can expect if you were excavating, for example. Uh, you might come across something like this if you're encountering a turkey pin. Royal Hondo Pueblo, this is a wonderful site for turkey pins as well. Uh, this is actually showing some post holes where there would have been a pin. Uh, this is in a, a Plaza G context from the site. But I also wanted to show this photograph, which shows us a little bit better. Uh, this is, again, excavated, but they found the remains of these wooden posts. Again, this isn't a plaza. This is Plaza K. There were a lot of turkeys, a lot of pins in Plaza K at this site. And within these small areas, very similar to Pendy Pueblo, for example, uh, they found turkey droppings, again, fragmented pieces of ceramics that suggested the presence of uh, sort of turkey watering bowls, a lot of eggshells, pults. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just a, a very interesting contextual deposit to think about when you come across a turkey pin, and especially the variability in, in the uh, locations where these pins show up. You know, we can think about uh, uh, the turkey pin site where we have this small little structure within a shelter. Uh, we also have these sites uh, like Broken Flute Cave where you have abandoned or reused pit structures. And there's a site quite close to Broken Flute Cave where instead of a abandoned pit structure uh, being used as a turkey pin, there was an intentional creation and construction of a large, large circular pit structure, uh, which was probably intentionally used as a pin. So again, there's a lot of variability in how turkeys are being kept through time. Uh, but what's important here is this record of turkey dung uh, and sort of the presence of these enclosed spaces. And we find this very interesting trajectory of, uh, of sort of using wooden enclosures through time. Uh, and again, we're talking about roughly, a, a, you know, perhaps a you know, thousand year period, uh, essentially, uh, where we have this uh, very unique construction that's showing up in a variety of different spaces through space and time uh, in the Southwest. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, Great, uh, we can find and identify turkey pins. This is wonderful, but why is this important? Well, the American Southwest, the Mexican Northwest, it is very, very, very cool if you think about turkeys, uh, if you like turkeys, uh, because ancestral Pueblo peoples had a domesticated turkey here in the Southwest. So I'm gonna walk through some DNA evidence right now, right? And, and we're gonna go through a couple slides. What I wanted to note first, though, is that all the DNA that I'm going to talk about is based on mitochondrial DNA results or analysis. And so what we know is that roughly 2,000 years ago, uh, the archaeological record, turkeys uh, show up in a domesticated form. They have a domesticated genetic signal. Uh, this is a, 
a haplogroup that they are uh, unique to, uh, also a haplotype, I suppose. Uh, and what we see is that this Pueblo domesticated turkey shows up uh, essentially across time and space in various portions of the uh, of the Southwest. Uh, it's ubiquitous, you could say. Uh, and this is a domesticated form. Now, what's very interesting and likely very complicated is that the wild Merriam's turkey, which is found today in the Southwest, I, this turkey does not appear to be the progenitor of this domesticated Pueblo turkey. So again, the wild turkey that we know of today in the Southwest is not the turkey that appears to have been domesticated to create this ancestral Pueblo domesticated form. This is quite important. We see that there's a little bit of wild Merriam's uh, DNA that is, that is present within these ancestral Pueblo turkeys, but essentially it's very small. And it suggests that there's a very low level of uh, integration, uh, sort of interbreeding. What's interesting is that there is a larger portion of ancestral Pueblo domesticated turkey DNA that is showing up in sort of modern day wild Marion's population. So we know that some of these domesticated birds probably they escaped, became feral and, and interbred with these wild Marion's. Again, this is all mitochondrial DNA. The complexity here is that uh, if you look at the rest of this uh, sort of DNA structure, um, it looks like the progenitor of the domesticated Pueblo turkeys, these ancestral Pueblo turkeys, uh, is related to birds that are today located in the eastern United States, so east of this area. Again, this is based on the current biogeography and sort of known distribution of turkeys within this part of North America. So again, you know, take this with a grain of salt. Uh, but the, the broader point here is that we have clear evidence that there is a domesticated turkey that was kept in the Southwest. It was managed, it was husbanded. These turkeys were being bred and they were being kept isolated to some degree from wild Merriams. So how can you do this, uh, especially without some type of pinning or enclosing or captivity? That's why uh, the DNA record that we have is really important when contextualizing and thinking uh, about sort of why pins matter uh, and why they matter for the story of the DNA, which we're still trying to really fully understand. At the same time, we have to think about turkey diets. So there's been a lot of work uh, uh, over the past several dec decades, actually, on stable isotopes. So essentially trying to understand the geochemical uh, signal of, of various tissues. Uh, so for example, if you know, I love tortilla chips and salsa, if you were to take my fingernail and analyze it for the, for the isotopes, uh, you're going to get a C4 value. That's because maize, corn, is a C4 plant. And when we talk about C4 plants versus C3 plants, we're really talking about plants that photosynthesize in different ways. They're essentially creating a different type of uh, uh, sort of compound with varying numbers of carbons uh, for their sugar. So that's really the critical part. And what we see is that a lot of grasses, especially maize and corn, uh, are C4 plants. And so again, uh, this is quite useful uh, within the American Southwest, Mexican Northwest, and elsewhere because you can track the consumption of these C4 resources, whether you're talking about humans or animals, uh, and you can track sort of, you know, this record of, of what these organisms are eating and how this might relate to you know, human processes and this human adaptation. So again, you have corn as a C4 plant. If you have these wonderful turkeys that are eating these C4 plants, especially maize, uh, then they should have a C4 value. And what we see from modern wild turkeys, uh, again, these are sort of the present day wild turkeys caught from hunters or elsewhere, uh, they tend to not have the C4 value. So maize and what we would consider a C4 value should show up right around negative 10 right here. And the important, important component of this plot that you're seeing is that a lot of modern day wild turkeys, they don't have this signal, which makes sense because modern wild turkeys, they're really consuming things like insects, seeds, other critters. I'm going to show a photo of a turkey eating a worm a little bit later. Uh, you know, these are resources that aren't typically sort of C4 or what we think of. Uh, they're not obtaining that type of sugar compound, essentially, uh, from plants that are producing it. And if you look at the archaeological evidence that we have for these stable isotope results in turkeys, uh, this just matches the evidence across the board. So this top plot is showing all the turkeys that I've been able to find, my colleague and I, Andrew Somerville, have been able to find from Mesoamerica in the published record. The bottom plot here is showing, again, turkeys from the southwest and northwest uh, in their stable isotope results. And what we see is that aside from some very interesting sites that I wish I could talk about, but I won't today, like Tijeras, Pueblo, and elsewhere, 
uh, turkeys in the Southwest, in the ancestral Pueblo world, seem to be consuming this diet that's very heavy in C4 resources. They're clearly consuming maize. Uh, there are not a lot of other C4 plants uh, that you can harvest or consume in great enough quantities as a turkey uh, to be able to obtain a C4 value like this. Amaranth is a very important one because that is talked about quite a bit, but it would be quite challenging for a turkey to consume enough amaranth in the wild to have a purely C4 value, uh, just based on some of the physiological processes that are involved in this uh, sort of isotope ratio that's being incorporated into bones. And for example, I just wanted to show this quickly here before moving on to the Parito. If you look at Royal Hondo Pueblo, uh, my colleagues and I uh, did some work on turkeys there, uh, and some folks have come back uh, and also studied the DNA. We see that the bulk of the turkeys from this site, where there's again, wonderful evidence for turkey pinning, this very, intricate and close relationship between humans and turkeys and their management, um, uh, you know, it, it really suggests that they're eating corn. There's a lot of turkeys here uh, and they, they have this C4 dietary signal. Now I wanna be very specific here. In this example from Royal Hondo Pueblo, in this specific case, because we know from elsewhere, especially Tijeras Pueblo, uh, that we have a different story. These three birds, that have a diet that does not seem to be focused on C4 resources. So perhaps they, they're accessing more of a, you know, quote unquote, natural diet in the wild. Two of these birds had successful DNA analyzed by Brian Kemp and his colleagues. And two of these birds were non Pueblo domesticated turkeys. So these are wild Merriam's turkeys. Of all of these turkeys that had C4 values, of all of the turkeys that were successfully analyzed, and there's a big batch here, uh, well into the 70s, they are all, based on the ones that were successful, Pueblo domesticated turkeys. So again, even at a Royal Hondo, where we have evidence for pinning, we see that they are exploiting and using and managing different types of turkeys at the same time, and they are essentially participating uh, in this uh, active management of birds in the sense of feeding them and providing them access to maize. At the same time, they're also exploiting non-domesticated turkeys and those turkeys are allowed to have a diet which is different. So again, this is really uh, sort of important, I think, when we conceptualize how we think about turkeys in the Southwest because it, it tells us that there is a lot going on and we really need to consider this on sort of a site-by-site -site and context-by-context -context level which hopefully is a good segue into the situation from the Palmerito Plateau. So I want to talk now about LA4618. I'm, and I'm going to mention a couple other sites from the Palmerito Plateau and, and specifically Los Alamos National Laboratory. But this site is a very interesting and curious site. And I think you'll, you'll agree with me on that as we get through this here. So the Palmerito Plateau, I wanted to briefly mention, you know, we see sort of year-round habitation and occupation of the plateau, which again is located sort of right on the western banks of the Rio Grande and the eastern flank of the Jemez Mountains. And I, you know, we see sort of this year-round occupation by ancestral public people really beginning in the early to mid 1100s, AD 1100s. One of the sites uh, that was occupied during that time is this is a small little single room block Pueblo, uh, roughly, roughly had 13 rooms. It also had this Kiva space and perhaps a rectangular or square shaped kiva as well. This is an artist's rendering of what the site looked like. So we know based on the radiocarbon record and, and this site had a, a variety of dating that occurred. Uh, essentially the site was occupied right during the 1200s. So it's a great, uh, what we would call coalition era site, which is just this uh, sort of cultural phase or complex that archeologists have applied to this time. But it was really occupied right during the 1200s when we see this proliferation of these small scale sites, these, these sort of small little uh, um, single room off pueblos that are showing up across a variety of mesas uh, across the Parvito Plateau. So we have really good temporal resolution is the uh, sort of key point there. But we also see that of the faunal assemblage from the site, it is dominated by turkeys. Uh, there were roughly uh, 659, uh, I think identified um, uh, skeletal elements here on the faunal assemblage. And, and of those elements, of those faunas, you know, over 300 were turkey, uh, over, you know, 58%, essentially, a little over 58% of the assemblage was dominated by turkey bones. We also see that turkeys are clustered in interesting context. So from this room 11, which again may have been a special ceremonial place, uh, 
we see the presence of at least four different birds. This is based on overlapping crania. So these are four different turkey crania. We also know that from this room context, we have some evidence for turkey disease. And again, I haven't talked about this, but it's a, it's a just remarkable component of the human turkey record uh, in the Southwest. You know, turkeys with this level of disease present on their bones, it is very unlikely that they'll survive in the wild. So this is really speaking to a form of altruism between ancestral Pueblo peoples and their birds and really keeping these birds and making sure that they can survive uh, and, and live uh, in order to, to really obtain this awful, awful, uh, what looks like this degenerative bone disease. Uh, this is on the femur. We also see uh, that uh, Camilla Speller and her colleagues, when they originally published uh, this awesome DNA study of turkeys uh, uh, back in 2010, they analyzed several samples from this site. Uh, and so we know from domestic turkeys, or we know from the turkey bones that they analyzed from room four and then right outside room three, uh, that these are the Pueblo domesticated turkeys. So we have strong DNA evidence that says, yes, these are domesticated turkeys showing up at the site. We also see from some stable isotope work, and, and this was done from Tiffany Rawlings and John Driver uh, and some work that we're currently working on at the laboratory. We see the turkeys from a variety of contexts, including those same samples that have, are from, uh, you know, sort of identifying these Pueblo domesticated birds, uh, that they are eating a maize diet. And again, you know, thinking about these C4 values and these isotope results that are showing up in these turkey bones, uh, you know, based on the, the bone tissue that we're analyzing, there's really no other way a turkey could get that value without eating uh, a diet that's almost entirely maize. So it's very, very important uh, to note this. And then finally, I, I went back and measured some of these bones because one of the questions here is, okay, we now know we have this site. It's clearly occupied right during the 1200s. Turkeys are dominating the faunal assemblage. They're showing up in large numbers. Uh, we have a lot of different turkeys that are clearly at this site. They're domesticated turkeys and they're turkeys that are eating corn. So are we dealing with male or female turkeys? So this is, uh, I have Gwen Young to, to thank for this. She let me uh, measure uh, two skeletons of turkeys that were killed sort of in uh, northern New Mexico in the 90s. One was a female, one was a male, uh, same area, same hunting uh, event. Uh, and what I want to show you here is the uh, tarsal metatarsus. And uh, again, this idea that I uh, uh, you can help you. You can identify the sex of turkey bones uh, in certain settings, in certain contexts, uh, using certain bones uh, because turkeys are sexually dim dimorphic. So, especially if you're dealing with adult specimens, and if you can uh, really clearly support that, then it, it provides a venue uh, to sort of you know, try and get an idea of the demographics of the turkey population. I should also note you can do this with DNA now too, which is very very cool. So, there's a lot of exciting things going on in the turkey world still. But getting back to 4618, uh, again, these triangles represent the modern specimens, these comparative specimens. These circles represent complete elements where I can measure both the breadth of the distal end and also the breadth of the proximal end. And we see that these, these really suggest that these are hens, that these are female birds that are showing up at this site. Uh, these lines represent an element where I can only measure essentially one side, one variable. And so we see, though, that if you roughly estimate this, we're probably dealing, again, with these smaller sized turkeys. We're probably dealing with turkey hens. And this is quite interesting because, of course, now we have another line of evidence that really supports this idea that turkeys should be kept at this site. There's, you know, very clear evidence that we have domesticated turkeys. They're eating corn. We have turkey hens. Uh, you know, again, all of these lines of evidence really tell us that turkeys must be kept somewhere uh, and they must be kept for their breeding and for their reproduction and increasing these flock sizes, presumably, uh, but also just to be able to allow access to that level of maize for their consumption. And yet, uh, just to sort of conclude this site, there is no evidence for pens. Uh, this is one of just the biggest mysteries to me, I think, uh, especially for sites like 4618. You know, we have these various lines of evidence. They all speak and support to this concept that Turkey should be penned somewhere. They should be kept in order to facilitate um, uh, uh, sort of this process, this human management of them. And again, you know, thinking about management, I'm really trying to talk about this dietary management for turkeys, you know, allowing turkeys to consume maize, providing that maize for the birds uh, uh, clearly was quite important in the ancestral public world. But, 
we don't have any evidence from this site that there was any keeping or pinning of turkeys. There's no enclosures, there's no cap captivity areas, uh, there are no dung deposits. Even the areas outside of the pueblo that were excavated, uh, they had no clear uh, sort of walled off areas uh, that sort of matched or suggested or provided evidence for any type of pin. And yet again, we have all these other lines of evidence that suggest that they're keeping turkeys uh, and they're, they're very clearly, uh, uh, they have this very close relationship with their birds, uh, ancestral public peoples at this uh, ancestral place, this village. Okay, so let's take a step back for a moment. Uh, this is a map showing where 4618 is uh, generally uh, on Parito Plateau. And it's also showing uh, really this outline here of where Los Alamos National Laboratory is. These are 32 different sites that have been excavated, uh, especially uh, you know, throughout the 20th century uh, after the laboratory was founded. Uh, there was a lot of excavation that occurred at coalition aged sites. So these uh, roughly smaller, probably less than 25 rooms, sometimes they're a little bit bigger, uh, but these coalition aged sites, many of these sites have turkey bones present. Uh, turkeys often are, are sort of the dominant fauna uh, from these assemblages. Again, these sites vary in their level of systematic excavation. If screening was used, a lot of this was done in the 50s and some of this was done in the late 2000s. So we have a lot of variation in what's going on here. But the very, very important part is that none of these sites have any evidence of turkey droppings. None of these sites have any evidence for essentially any enclosed spaces that were used as a turkey pin. Uh, we have and we're still trying to work on some of the stable isotope and DNA uh, sort of analysis from birds from some of these other sites, but some of the preliminary data suggests that they're still consuming corn and that turkeys have access to maize that are found in these other, uh, other locations. And yet we have no evidence, uh, essentially no supporting evidence at all uh, for turkey pens. And I, I wanted to circle on call out 12587, this other site right here, this is an interesting site because there are very, very few turkey eggshells that have been identified uh, from the Parito Plateau. I have taken a look through these collections. There are thousands and thousands of uh, uh, excavated and curated items and objects uh, from these various sites. And yet 12587 uh, is one of the only sites that has turkey eggshells and it only has two eggshells present. So again, uh, something is going on here. You know, clearly ancestral Pueblo peoples had access to these domesticated birds and think back again to this idea that those birds are really being kept isolated from wild Merriam's turkeys. At the same time, we know from a lot of biological, ecological evidence that wild turkeys were up here on the Palo Plateau. They were present, they're still present today. So ancestral public peoples had access to two different types of turkeys and yet the domesticated turkeys, at least from LA 4618, were clearly consuming a diet that had a, a very heavy anthropogenic role uh, in, in sort of providing that diet or providing access to that diet. Now, I wanted to show this image, uh, this historic photograph, uh, because I think it speaks to a lot of different things going on here. Odui Pueblo, this is a classic period Pueblo site, several hundred rooms, multi-story, uh, and uh, really quite significant. The uh, Pueblo de San Ildefonso, this is one of their ancestral sites. Uh, in fact, uh, before they moved down to the Rio Grande to the location of where their village is today, this was one of the last sites that was occup occupied uh, essentially right up until contact or close to contact. Now, this was excavated by one of uh, uh, Hewitt's colleagues, Lucy Wilson, uh, who was very much ahead of her time. Uh, this was in 1914, 15-ish, uh, so during World War I. And she excavated this site quite extensively. And in fact, uh, there's a note that she uh, published and she really talks about how screening was not needed because there wasn't anything important really uh, that they couldn't just sort of see for themselves which you know uh, for our <laughs> modern form of archaeology is quite a shocking statement but uh, uh, you know luckily this photo survives because the records from this excavation are lost uh, her manuscript what she wrote up is lost uh, very few artifacts I think only a couple hundred uh, mostly ceramics uh, artifacts have survived through time from their work at the site. And again, they, they excavated uh, many, many rooms, a huge portion of the site. But if you look into her photo archives, and these are the Palace of the Governors in New Mexico, what you see is this really remarkable image, what is called the Turkey Room. That was the caption, the only caption really provided with this photo. Uh, and it's coming from an unknown room, an unknown location within Odui Pueblo. What's important here, though, is that a lot of the larger classic period villages on the Palo Plateau, which were occupied and constructed and uh, 
and really lived in and used a couple hundred years after a site like 4618. Uh, a lot of these sites were excavated uh, in the early 1900s, uh, and so we don't we don't really have a really good modern understanding. And of course, the the goals of archaeology were much different during that time. And so, you know, this is a a, a big influence I'm going to talk about here in a moment uh, on our archaeological understanding of perhaps this human Turkey relationship. But what we can obtain from this photograph from Odoui Pueblo is really quite special, I think. You know, these two individual turkeys, these are clearly burials showing up. This is one within one individual room context. You know, there's no evidence for a turkey pin here, nothing that's very clear or, or, or stands out, but that's not really the importance of this. The importance of this is that it really speaks to this idea that turkeys held a very special place uh, to, to the Pueblo peoples that were living up here on the Palmarito Plateau. And so we see this evidence from 4618 you know, we can hypoth hypothesize and really contextualize what's going on with how are they being kept, how they're being pinned. But something to keep in mind is that that might not matter so much because clearly turkeys were, were very significant. Uh, they held a special place in the world, sort of their sphere uh, within the ancestral Pueblo, uh, a sort of human experience uh, uh, was very closely tied together. And that's something that I think is, is really critical here, that perhaps uh, you know, turkey pinning and sort of thinking about pins or whether or not those pins are present or absent uh, is maybe not so much as not so much as important as sort of remembering and, and, and considering the fact that uh, turkeys, you know, they were critical, uh, both functionally, but also uh, in a way and sort of a, a conceptualization of the world that we can't really understand or grasp today. And so I just wanted to highlight that just with this one image that survives from the work at Odoui Pueblo. Okay, I love this photograph. Uh, this is great. I actually just found this the other day, but what a wonderful turkey eating this worm. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, but uh, much more importantly, where are the pins? You know, going back to this idea of if we think about the Palmito Plateau, if we think about turkeys and turkey pins that show up quite consistently uh, in sort of a diverse nature throughout the rest of the Southwest and Mexican Northwest, where are the pins on the Parito Plateau? There are a couple different things that could be happening here. I wanted to just walk through this right here before we're uh, wrapping up. It is possible that we're missing evidence, uh, but again, you know, there have been many, many, uh, especially coalition age sites that have been excavated from the Parito Plateau at Los Alamos National Laboratory and elsewhere. So I don't really think we're missing evidence. I think we actually have a very strong, robust sample size, and so the. The fact that we have an absence of pins in those small coalition sites, that's telling us something. I don't think that we're missing evidence necessarily. I think it's actually speaking to a different process. Something that could be happening, and I think you know, a lot of these really involve much more research, is sort of this idea of cleaning or sort of um, you know, potentially closing pins. You know, we talk a lot about the ritual closing of spaces and uh, uh, abandonment of certain areas, especially in ancestral Pueblo villages. Maybe we need to think about this with pins. You know, perhaps the uh, the evidence of these turkeys showing up in a site like 4618 uh, is quite intentional, and, and perhaps they really were pinned there. But we see sort of a, a lack of evidence for this because there was some type of cleaning or closure to these spaces that we uh, simply haven't been able to uh, identify in an analytical sense. It's also possible that pins are located elsewhere. So again, I'm talking, you know, I mentioned this idea that these classic period pueblos, which have large village plazas, they were excavated early on. People were really not interested in turkeys that much then. Uh, and so we might just be missing some of this evidence, but there's a temporal component of this. We have to remember that these sites, these coalition sites, we have such you know, a robust number that have been excavated and we don't have any evidence for pins there. So again, this really speaks to the fact that, well, perhaps pins are being kept outside of villages and maybe our excavations aren't capturing that area. If you look back to the ethno-historic and ethnographic record, that, that's really suggested quite strongly that these really uh, sort of what we might think of simple corralling techniques uh, are occurring outside of villages. And they're also occurring inside of villages, but specifically usually within uh, village plazas. If pins are located elsewhere, then this uh, really brings up this idea of, well, are turkeys being placed within, uh, again, some of these contexts for different reasons? And so, you know, perhaps we do, you know, we clearly have domesticated turkeys and they're eating maize uh, that are showing up in this site. We have this record of hens uh, that are showing up there. Uh, 
perhaps those turkeys were left there, perhaps they were placed there, that the archeological uh, uh, sort of processes that uh, accumulated these remains that we excavated so many hundreds of years later, perhaps there's a special placement that's occurring. And, and, and so that lack of pin, again, uh, doesn't really speak to the fact that uh, uh, there wasn't a pin, it's just that you know, perhaps it's elsewhere. But I also wanted to note that I think it's uh, you know, quite valuable to consider the fact that there is a non-pinning strategy occurring within this region. I, you know, it, it's really interesting. A lot of folks have thought about and talked about the fact that turkeys sometimes are kind of awful. Uh, they will sort of abuse humans. I, you know, they will stick around settlements. They will try and track down food. They'll do all of these things. And so, you know, this idea of turkeys domesticating themselves, uh, you know, I think that there's, there's something behind that. And so we have to question, you know, this idea of, well, could turkeys, again, thinking about this domestication process and their genetic signal, could they have been allowed to essentially not be pinned uh, and been allowed to sort of range around the environment uh, and still be exploited and used by ancestral Pueblo people? I think the answer is yes, but it does not explain at all this record of C4 dietary signals in their uh, bone isotopes. That is the tricky part because that really indicates a, a very specific root of uh, of feeding. And again, we could think about sort of midding contexts and refuse areas where perhaps turkeys were accessing maize, but you have to eat a lot of maize and you have to really eat full-time maize uh, in order to get these types of values, especially for turkey bones and their diet. So again, I don't really have an answer for where the pins are, but I think that we have to broaden our idea of what's going on with this human-turkey relationship to, to really be able to answer some of these questions about how they're being held captive or really being enclosed or tethered or, or these various types of painting strategies. Alrighty, before I pull up my question slide, which has a fun photo for everyone, I just wanted to take a moment because often I, I this gets skipped over. I, a lot of this turkey work, I, I'm very grateful to many people. I mean, this is, I, uh, I'm not the first person to think these ideas, uh, nor will I be the last. You know, a lot of people have thought and, and really put a lot of time and effort into conceptualizing what's going on with turkeys. And so, uh, I have some colleagues listed here who helped on this uh, PowerPoint with photos and various things, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Crow Canyon, to Taylor, also to Kyle for sort of recommending uh, uh, this talk to Crow Canyon. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. And with that, let me share this wonderful historic photo and I will open it up to questions. Oops. Okay. So Jean, you might have to Remind me here, do I open up the Q&A? Let's see. Um, let me, okay. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be asking you the questions. So okay. um, first okay. of all, thank, thank you so much, Sila. That was, uh, that was really um, a very interesting presentation. Um, I'll start, uh, one of the first questions that came in was um, asking whether there's any evidence from of other bird species uh, besides turkeys in these pens? That's a great question. Um, Pindi Pueblo is probably one of the most intriguing examples of where it's likely that there were pins within pins. Um, and in fact, if you bear with me for a moment, uh, <coughs> I can try and pull up the slide. So try not to get too sick here. Uh, yes, ancestral Pueblo people, they pinned various types of birds. So especially eagles, raptors, um, and of course, we all know of macaws. Uh, those were quite significant, and those birds were pinned within various contexts. We know from Zuni Pueblo, from ethnohistoric, some ethnographic records, uh, that there's very clear evidence of small scale pins for eagles, uh, where they're sort of constructed out of uh, wooden materials, uh, often with mud, sort of adobe, and there are these small sort of uh, uh, pins that show up. Uh, Pakime has uh, great records uh, of uh, macaw pins, for example. But those pins are distinct from the turkey pins that are also at that site. Um, something that's curious with Pindi Pueblo, I want to pull this back up. You see this small sort of half circle structure right here. I didn't put a photo of it, but this is a small little adobe mud structure that likely functioned as a pin for an individual bird. Now, of course, when they excavated this site, uh, the the excavators really pulled from the Zuni ethnographic record to say this must have been a pin for an eagle. We don't actually have any archaeological evidence that supports that. It could have been a pin for an individual bird. And we often see 
individual turkey pins that are showing up in some of these sites. So I think the answer is yes, other types of birds were most definitely pinned with turkeys, but they were also pinned separately from turkeys in their own confined spaces. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I think that your picture here may answer the next question, but um, the question is, were the pens facing out from a Pueblo or were they on the inside of Pueblos? And could turkeys have been used as quote unquote watchbirds? That's an interesting question. Had I thought about turkeys as a watchbird before? <laughs> Quite curious, actually. Um, you see both lines of evidence. So if we think archaeologically, uh, a lot of the evidence for pens shows up in either intentionally constructed rooms that were intentionally used for pens or rooms that were reused as pens. Often those rooms are on the edges of plazas or the edges of villages, uh, sort of close to the exterior. But again, these are in walled spaces and defined spaces. Typically, these wooden pens are found within plazas that are enclosed Pueblo plazas uh, or, or roughly enclosed. Uh, some of the plazas uh, from various sites are, are, are more open, I suppose. But we don't really see you know, evidence, at least archaeologically, that I'm aware of, of a lot of turkey pens that are kept in spaces that are exterior to villages that are really uh, accessible or available to the, to the outside world. Um, in the Mesa Verde region, for example, a lot of the masonry rooms uh, sort of are designed in a way that they're constructed to the roof of shelters and, and essentially caves. Uh, and then pins were in those back spaces. So they really used this sort of non-anthropogenic space, this it's kind of natural form uh, to help pin these turkeys uh, in, in the back of some of these villages. So it's a good question, but I would, I would also add that there is some ethno-historic evidence of turkeys being pinned essentially on the exterior walls of Pueblos or other Spanish introduced domesticates or Euro American introduced domesticates being pinned or corralled in these areas that are really just on the exterior walls of Pueblos. Good, thank you. Um, were the turkeys indigenous to the area or were they brought from somewhere else? And if so, where? Oh, that is a wonderful question. Um, okay. From what we can tell, the wild Merriam's turkey, which is still present here in the Southwest today, theoretically was present here in the Southwest prior to what we would define as the ancestral Pueblo period. So there are roughly 10,000 year old turkey bones from sites in the Southwest. These turkeys are presumably wild Merriam's turkeys. And so that kind of that paleontological record. Um, you know, the non, non archaeological records suggest that turkeys were here, these wild Merriam's turkeys, but there really hasn't been DNA evidence to support that. But we, we see the presence of physical turkey bones. But the question, of course, is for these ancestral Pueblo domesticated turkeys, this intentional process where we have this very clear genetic signal of a domesticated bird. You know, the, the closest relatives genetically are, are really today located in the eastern United States. So one of the big questions has been, is that distribution today the same as it was 2,000 years ago or probably more uh, when this domestication you know, event uh, occurred? And, and again, it, it's hard to think of it as a sort of instantaneous or immediate process, but clearly either we are misunderstanding the pre-contact distribution of turkeys in North America or as that question implies, uh, there might have been some type of movement or integration of birds from elsewhere uh, in sort of today what we think of as the United States. So it's a, it's a great question and we need to do more work to really figure this out. So, so several people have questions about what the turkeys were used for. Um, in other words, what uses of turkeys were there in the Southwest? And another question had to do with um, did the Pueblo people eat turkeys? And if so, when did they start eating turkeys? You're, you're, you're on, on mute, mute Siler. Siler, you muted yourself. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. I was taking some moments to sort of think about this. I, okay. So the question is what turkeys were used for. And then if turkeys were eaten. Yes. That, okay. Yes. Uh, boy. Turkeys were used for a lot. I, I think that when we think about this human relationship with the birds, 
we really have to start thinking about um, what's the best way to put this? Uh, for lack of a better sort of description, sort of a whole organism approach. Uh, I, you know, turkeys, we have great evidence. Bill Leip and, and his colleagues in this recently published paper on turkey feather blankets, for example. Mm. Uh, we know that turkeys were used for their feathers. Feathers were quite important. Turkeys could stay alive and still be used for their feathers and those feathers exploited. But turkey eggs were also very significant. Turkey eggs, uh, you can use eggs as a, a sort of a paint binder. The albumin in eggs are, are very important. Turkey eggs themselves are, are, you know, those had a special role because they increased turkey flocks. So you need turkey eggs essentially to, to grow these uh, domesticated flocks of turkeys that you have. Uh, but turkey bones were also used for a variety of uh, tools, uh, flutes and whistles, other types of items that have a, you know, not really, you know, in some cases you can think of a socioeconomic purpose, but they really have a special type of ceremonial role that we probably don't really understand. And, I, and there's also a, a very important record of turkey iconography. This idea of turkey tracks that shows up on you know, a variety of uh, uh, ceramic assemblages from various uh, Pueblo villages and various contexts throughout the Southwest. We see turkeys on rock art. And so there is a whole uh, sort of component of this human-turkey relationship that is living in a space that is really hard to physically think about tonight. Um, and so again, you know, turkeys, uh, you know, they were used, they were exploited for a lot of different things. And that last question about consumption, turkeys were most definitely eaten. Uh, a big a big portion of the turkey research that's out there really indicates actually that there might have been a fluctuating use of the birds through time, that perhaps turkeys were only, only sort of used for feathers earlier on, and then they became a, an important source of food later on. It, it's an interesting narrative, and it, it, it's an interesting record as well, because uh, there's a lot of supporting evidence for that when you think about cut marks and sort of the, the total numbers of turkeys that show up at some of these sites. And yet, if you think about the evidence that we have for turkeys through time, you really see a consistent level of diversity. You know, turkey feathers were used from the earliest time periods until the latest time periods, uh, up until contact and after in the Southwest. The same goes for eggshells. The same goes for turkey bones. And I would argue that the same goes for turkeys as food. And so I think that, that the bird really just held such a, an important, prominent role in uh, Pueblo society as it still does today. Uh, so can you speak to the petroglyph images of turkeys on the Pajarito Plateau? Um, and somewhat related um, is whether turkey artifacts show up in any kivas. I'm going to mute myself there. Um, I'm going to take us back to another slide a little bit, a little bit later on here. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, turkey petroglyphs on the Pajarito Plateau. And it's a, it's an interesting question. You know, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, to, to kind of uh, obtain this record and, and really sort of understand exactly where petroglyphs are showing up and how many there are. So what we know, and I just want to pull up this map, is that there are a lot of petroglyph sites. There are a lot of petroglyphs that are associated with, you know, a, a very special site type on the Pajarito Plateau that I, I think folks will be aware of are cave eights. Uh, uh, these excavated uh, structures into the uh, canyon walls, you know, we see uh, associated with a lot of these cave eight sites, uh, turkey petroglyphs or petroglyphs of birds, uh, other types of bird imagery. And in fact, you know, this uh, sort of area of the Pajarito Plateau, we have this interesting cluster of sites that have been excavated. Many of these sites have a lot of turkey bones. Uh, this would have been associated with uh, essentially a wetland in the past, um, sort of the canyon bottom here in Pajarito Canyon. Uh, but we also see a lot of evidence for turkey petroglyphs. And I, and I, I didn't show any. I don't have any here. But what I, you know, again, it's it's probably good that I can't really pinpoint or describe these petroglyphs or really how to how to think about them because uh, it, it's not really our place, I suppose, to to be able to do that. But their presence, their their abundance, and and they are quite abundant. Uh, these representations of turkeys really speaks to this idea that we can't really just think of turkeys as a product or that turkeys provided a product for ancestral public peoples. We have to think of turkeys uh, in a much more holistic sense and really try and understand this human relationship with the birds because the iconographic depictions are, are I would say, just as important as the evidence we have from the DNA and the isotopes that are, you know, each telling us something a little bit different about this relationship. And I, 
I wish I had more to say, but it's probably the best best answer I can give. And and do you have any evidence of turkeys um, uh, in kivas? Thank you for that question. Uh, yes. Uh, for, uh, if the question was about the Parido Plateau specifically, then yes, there is some evidence of turkey remains uh, being excavated, recovered from these special kiva type of contexts. Um, but turkeys also show up in other uh, sort of kiva spaces throughout the rest of the Southwest. So again, they had, you know they, they had a, a important role, and, and often you find um, turkey burials, intentional placement of the birds within uh, some of these very special spaces. So uh, an, another person so, uh, wondered if turkey pens might have been next to the fields rather than right next to the, you know, where people were living. It, it's yep. just kind of an a open-ended question. <laughs> it's a good question. You know, that's the, that's the type of thing that I think we have to think about because, you know, it's very curious. If you read the agricultural literature today, uh, there's some interesting records of turkeys and exactly how turkeys forage within cornfields, especially in the Midwestern United States. And what folks have found is that when turkeys are in those fields, for example, uh, they often are not eating a lot of corn. If they are, it's usually corn that's died or uh, sort of on the ground. They're not really exploiting or damaging um, uh, any growing stock. So there's, uh, you know, they, they love to consume though a lot of things like insects. I mean, grasshoppers, for example, they're, they're going crazy. Um, so this idea, you know, could turkeys be pinned next to fields Quite possibly. In fact, I would argue that that would make a lot of sense. But then we have to still think about how are turkeys getting access to all that maize? I mean, are people intentionally sort of providing fodder for them within these cage spaces? That that would be probably the assumption then. Um, you know, it, it's just a very interesting type of uh, uh, relationship to think about how did ancestral Pueblo peoples control the access of feeding for the turkeys, but also in spaces where other animals and and different types of critters would not come in and try and consume all of that maize that they might be throwing out for those turkeys to eat. So it's very curious. I mean, in, in other pin, pinning contexts where we have, you know, what would be a clear line of evidence for a turkey pin, often you find a whole bunch of evidence for maize. I mean, macro botanical evidence, even pollen uh, evidence that really suggests that, you know, turkeys are consuming maize and that maize is showing up in these, you know, dense deposits of turkey dung within those spaces. It's a good idea. Um, so another question that kind of relates to penning would be, um, given that well, the question is, given that the turkeys were used for feathers, could it be that their flying abilities, which I tend to think means they don't tend to fly very much, <laughs> sometimes meant that no pen was necessary? Yeah, it's true. I mean, and in fact, um, I'm trying to think of the site name. I think the village of the Great Kivas, again, this is a Zuni Pueblo, uh, ancestral Zuni site. You know, they have a, a pin structure there. It's a very long possible turkey pin. It's a long masonry walled structure, but no roof is present. Uh, and they found an individual turkey burial within that site. And I think it's the village of the Great Kivas, if I'm remembering this correctly. So that's a great question, this idea of, you know, do you need a roof? Can you enclose turkeys? Were they allowed to sort of... Um, you know, free fly and they're, you know, as implied, not great flyers. Um, but you also find evidence for turkey pens, for example, at Royal Hondo Pueblo, where they were intentionally con constructed in spaces that had roofs so that they were presumably protected. Now, again, this goes into this idea of, you know, this, that earlier question, turkeys as sort of watch keepers. Um, you know, there's some evidence that turkeys were protected. There's also some evidence that turkeys weren't protected at all, and yes, and yet they were still kept in pens. And there's a lot of interesting questions that come into this about, you know, uh, domesticated dogs in the ancestral Pueblo Southwest, and I, you know, what role that dogs played, but then other predators, other types of um, uh, birds of prey, for example. I mean, there's, it, it's very interesting because we have so many different diverse contexts where pens show up or, or pens are presumed to be showing up. Um, and yet they they have consistency in the type of evidence that appears, especially droppings and dung, and yet their design and their architecture is extremely variable. So, you know, again, I, I think that's quite possible. And I think it just kind of depends on the site by site, context by context uh, uh, sort of approach to understanding what's going on. So uh, 
another question has to do with turkey bones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and are there any cut marks on the bones that would mm -hmm. indicate butchering or the bones buried whole? Um, indicating some other purpose, and I guess a more open-ended question, what were turkey bones used for? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So yes, there are, uh, from throughout the Southwest, um, we see evidence of cut, cut marks on turkey bones. Those cut marks imply uh, sort of consumption or butchery for consumption. Turkey bones also show up uh, fragmented and broken in ways that, again, sort of suggest consumption. They're burnt off, and we find them burnt high. You know, again, a, a lot of lines of evidence that suggest that turkeys were consumed. But at the same time, we see cut marks and other evidence of butchery that may imply non-consumption or disarticulation. You know, bones even have evidence of plucking. You can get damage from plucking uh, by repeatedly plucking essentially feathers uh, that shows up on the bone themselves. So, uh, so turkey bones clearly have this... Um, evidence of butchery. And that has been a big argument or sort of uh, is, is involved in this argument that the use of turkeys changed through time from a bird that was really exploited for feathers to a bird that was consumed because of the different types of evidence that shows up on bones through time. Um, and the last part of that question, can you remind was me? was just what were bones used for? I think you mentioned oh. flutes and, and things, but are the, were, there, were they used for tool, as tools or... Yeah, we see evidence of turkey bones uh, being worked into tools. But what's very curious is that if, you know, and I'm guessing most folks here will know that, you know, bird bones are essentially hollow, or we can think of them as hollow. They're, they're quite brittle, especially some of the elements. And yet we see extremely thin, thin bones, uh, like turkey ulne, for example, um, uh, that are being worked into awls and different types of tools that appear in archaeological sites in their final tool form state, but a big question is, could they actually have been used as tools? Uh, because again, their, their nature, sort of the structure of the bone, their strength, it really uh, begs the question of were these, were these turkey bones being used as actual tools, even though they were worked into tools? Uh, I think we have a much stronger line of evidence to indicate that turkey bones were used for flutes and whistles. Even turkey calls uh, to hunt turkeys are created out of turkey bones. Hmm. Cool. Um, this is a, a really specific question, and, and you may have to do it on email, but one person asked if you had mentioned uh, someone named Speller, S-P-E-L-L-E-R, on one of the slides yes. in reference to a publication. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, Camilla Speller and her colleagues, uh, they were really the first folks to I uh, publish uh, her dissertation uh, is all on turkey DNA. They published this paper in, in 2010 on the in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it's all on this identified Pueblo domesticated turkey and that mitochondrial DNA signal. So her name is Camilla Speller. Is yes. that correct? Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so each day turkeys. <laughs> So this is kind of, I guess, one question that it all goes back to um, the whole idea of of penning or not penning. Could mm -hmm. could people have thrown maize on the ground each day, mm -hmm. which I know they do along the road I live in. That's how we mm -hmm. feed our resident flock of turkeys. <laughs> yep. um, and so the turkeys came daily to eat the maize, but then went back in the wild. Yeah, that possible. It is very much possible. Um, you know, again, there's a lot of interesting, uh, um, it, it is interesting to test that because it's actually possible to use isotopes to get at that. Um, you know, uh, putting out maize, allowing turkeys to essentially, you know, sort of come to villages during the day at these specific times. No doubt in my mind that the turkeys would have caught on to that immediately and would come back and forth and they would know that's a source of food for them. Um, you would also then assume, though, that turkeys would be able to consume other types of foods during the day and especially, you know, access to water and various things. This is where Tijeras Pueblo and my uh, colleague, but also my mentor, uh, Emily Jones, I, I worked with her and several others on the Tijeras Pueblo faunas or the turkeys, especially from. And, and this is a village site that's in the Sandias right outside of Albuquerque. It is a fascinating site because there doesn't seem to be any evidence for pens. And yet we have domesticated turkeys that. <laughs> 
we're both consuming a diet that is almost focused entirely in C4 resources, presumably maize, and then turkeys that were consuming a diet that had a significant component, which was non-maize. So they're allowed to eat other foods and they're accessing sources of protein uh, that were presumably not from maize itself. So that is actually something that, you know, if, if as we continue, I think, to analyze these turkeys and try and look at their geochemical composition, you know, stable isotopes are great because depending on the type of tissue you look at, you can look just at protein sources, but you can also look at proteins, fats, and, and essentially carbohydrates uh, uh, all together. And that allows you to, to begin to suss out different forms of nutrients and how they're being integrated into organisms, or in this case, turkey bones or turkey diets. And so you can get at this idea of, well, perhaps the carbohydrates, you know, maybe turkeys are consuming maize. Uh, they're being allowed to have some access to maize. Perhaps it's just being tossed out. And yet they're still able to eat, you know, grasshoppers and other types of insects and critters that are providing them a different source, perhaps a protein, for example, or something like that. So it is quite possible that that's happening. And I, I would argue that there is some evidence of that in the Southwest and we just have to continue. And I'm sure that we will find more. So this is another interesting question, and that is, is there any history of using turkey dung as fertilizer? Uh, great question. I, I think about this a lot. Um, not that I know of. So I guess the simplest answer is no. I don't think that folks have ever made a uh, or, or sort of identified a, an example, a context where that was very clearly happening. But you, you've got to think that, you know, there's a lot of turkey dung in some of these sites. You know, Sapawe, for example, was described as uh, essentially like a farm for turkey feathers, I think. Um, you know, there are a lot of turkeys that are showing up in some of these areas, a lot of pens. There would have been a lot of dung. What is that being used for? And this goes back to this idea of, for sites like 4618, you know, uh, perhaps pens were there. It's just that at final abandonment or sort of final use of these areas, that dung was perhaps cleaned up, reused. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a, I think a lot of interesting uh, uh, sort of research that needs to be done into that because it's quite possible and, and it would make a lot of sense logically. So uh, this question has is um, has to do with maiming. Is there any evidence mm -hmm. of maiming or hobbling turkeys after 900 CE? Maiming turkeys after so, 900 CE. Yes. Um, Yes, I think so. Um, but at the same time, I think whoever probably asked this question knows that some of the best evidence for maiming has been identified and, and published essentially in contexts that predate AD 900. But I am confident that that maiming is also occurring later in time. You know, there are a lot of there are a lot of interesting ancestral places that have turkeys and they have what we could consider turkey trauma or turkey disease, uh, you know, these different forms of uh, sort of ailments and, and really uh, rough situations for turkeys where their bones are broken and healed and all sorts of stuff. And it, and it really, again, kind of begs that question of uh, what is going on. And, I, you know, uh, um, Father Gill has uh, uh, sort of published on this quite extensively in the Southwest, sort of this idea of maiming or also uh, this altruistic relationship between bone trauma and healing and allowing turkeys to live. And I would say that there is evidence for maiming post 900, but I don't know that it's been published as such, I guess <laughs> is maybe the best way to say that. Okay. Um, we have time just for a couple of more questions. Okay. We really do appreciate your being so generous with your time. Yeah. Um, are turkeys mentioned in storytelling? That he's that has evolved from Pueblo ancestors. Yes, very much so. Um, I think it's one of the again, if we start to rethink, kind of reconceptualize our ideas of turkeys uh, in the archaeological record, we have to start thinking of things like the Turkey Girl story, for example, which is a very famous, well-known one. Uh, several different pueblos have a form of this, but it is a it's a very important and significant story for many reasons, but in the context of this talk, in the context of pinning, it talks about taking turkeys outside of villages, keeping turkeys outside of villages, uh, and sort of allowing them to be sort of pinned and confined and kept nearby villages, but sort of outside. And so again, it's a, uh, a very critical part of this because these stories, they, uh, you know, the, they're rooted uh, in experiences and these human experiences. And just like, I think, 
I'd make a big argument that there is, you know, this this concept of Turkey agency in the Southwest and thinking about what Turkeys were doing and how they were sort of facilitating their own relationship with ancestral Pueblo populations. The same is true for ancestral Pueblo peoples and their relationship with Turkeys and things like the Turkey story right? and, and several other descriptions, I think, really highlight that well. So a, a somewhat related question would be, is there any evidence for tribute to certain mm -hmm. elder turkeys that may have led flocks? Yes, I think so. I'm, you know, and in fact, in preparing for this talk, and, and now the site is going to, oh boy. I, yes, I, I think so. There's some evidence of some of some elder turkeys, some very old turkeys that were likely intentionally buried in, in some certain contexts in the Southwest. Um, at the same time, there is a uh, there is a very special, I think, um, sort of a pit structure site in eastern Arizona, right near the uh, sort of uh, border between Arizona and New Mexico, on uh, right there off of the I-40. Um, it is a individual, a young juvenile, uh, sort of Pueblo child buried on one side with an individual adult turkey and on the other side with a dog. And all three of them have these ceramic vessels that are placed on or near their head. So, hmm. you know, it, it's, it's just so interesting to think about what that means for how turkeys were viewed. And, and I think where that question's coming from, this idea that, that turkeys could be revered in some way, especially older turkeys that were, that were quite important uh, for sort of flock management perhaps, I think there's some evidence of that in, in certain burials. And I think there's also evidence of, of perhaps individual turkeys that that may have just been, you know, included in these flocks. And yet they had very special relationships with individual people in the past. And and that relationship we're able to see just a glimpse of in some of these contexts where we get these uh, uh, very special burials. Great. OK. And and. I'll combine two questions for our last question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one question is, what are the physical differences? You, I think you talked about the mm -hmm. DNA differences, but what are the physical differences between Miriam's turkey and the domesticated Pueblo turkey? And then the second question is, when did the domesticated turkey die out? In, under, in other words, when did they stop, quote, you know, kind of raising the domesticated turkeys? Yep. Those are excellent questions. Um, okay, so the physical differences. This is very intriguing. Um, I, I don't really know. Uh, and I think that is consistent throughout the Southwest um, uh, for folks who have been working on turkeys. There is an idea, you know, that based on a lot of the metric analysis that's occurred, uh, you know, they seem to have been the same size, roughly. I think we can say that the domesticated form of, uh, of this turkey was essentially the same size as, say, wild Merriam's turkeys. But we have very few desiccated or really mummified turkeys uh, that have survived through time that also have had DNA work done on them to really identify, is this actually a domesticated Pueblo turkey or is this a wild Merriam's? And, and that's a big gap in the record because the, uh, and, and these things are interrelated. Um, you know, the reason we don't really understand the physical form is that these turkeys likely went extinct again in physical form only. Remember that their their genetics, their DNA lives on in a small component, uh, a sort of wild Merriams today. Uh, but that happened sometime around contact. It, it hasn't really been worked out yet. And I think that uh, some of this really exciting work that's being done on on these these contact era sites, that's really going to be key to sort of working out and teasing out what's going on with very sort of late ancestral Pueblo domesticated turkeys prior to the arrival of, Sp of the Spanish and introduced domesticates and presumably when these turkeys uh, uh, became extinct in sort of their physical form. But I would, I would hazard a guess, I suppose, that, that that ancestral Pueblo turkey, that it was domesticated for some reason. And I think that the, the plumage, the coloration perhaps, the form, the physical side of that turkey must have been quite significant. Um, you know, otherwise we might see a situation that we see in Mesoamerica, for example, where there are a lot of different essentially wild turkeys um, and their domesticated form of the turkey is very closely related uh, essentially uh, to a couple of those uh, wild forms that still live today. And so there's a there's sort of a closer linear relationship, although, again, it's quite complex still. Uh, but we don't see that in the southwest. Again, we see this uh, sort of this progenitor that's occurring probably in eastern populations, perhaps, or maybe those. 
eastern populations were really within the southwest that we know and define today. So I think that the physical form, if we can find ways to identify that form or, or sort of uh, visualize it, will be uh, very important for thinking about why this domestication event occurred or the ultimate result of that domestication itself. So, so the, kind of the last question is, when did the domestication, did it stop or do certain communities in the southwest or elsewhere continue to hmm. um, kind of keep domesticated turkeys or, yep. you know, in the way that you've been talking about? Yep, that's a, that's a good question, too. I, you know, if you look back on some of these ethnographic, ethno-historic records, they often talk about domesticated, you know, domesticated turkeys that are walking around Pueblo villages in, you know, 1800s and 1900s. I always think of that with sort of like a footnote in mind or a little asterisk, because based on the archaeological evidence from the DNA, we know that those weren't domesticated in the sense of their genetics, that that domesticated form, that haplogroup, that haplotype that shows up was essentially gone by that point. These are almost undoubtedly wild Merriam's turkeys, or perhaps we have to consider that the introduction of other domesticated forms by Euro-Americans and, and others into, say, New Mexico and the Southwest in the post-contact era. But those, those birds that the Pueblo peoples had post-contact now that we see in photographs and various things, you know, it, it's most likely that we're actually looking at wild Merriams, essentially tamed wild Merriams or uh, birds that were captive and, and reared. And so, it, you know, it, it's a fascinating question because we see all this evidence for pinning and sometimes we don't see evidence for pinning. And yet we see all these other lines of evidence for this really close human uh, sort of relationship and, and active management of these birds. And yet when you look at that ethno-historic and ethnographic record, you see that uh, essentially wild Merriams, presumably, uh, could be kept uh, sort of enclosed. They could become a part of uh, uh, a village life and sort of consumption and ritual, you know, without having that genetic domesticated signal. So it's a it's a big question. We need to we need to sort it out still. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I'm gonna um, we we still have a number of questions. I know that that um, Taylor will be sending out an email to um, everyone who registered for this webinar. Uh, with um, Siler's uh, contact information. Yeah. So I know that you had said that you would be willing to answer more specific questions, if I am correct. Um, yeah. So so that would be, you know, that's a great way to continue, but it is um, uh, getting late. And so like I say, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm and passion for turkeys. <laughs> Yes. You definitely um, are. It's a great bird and, and you have a lot of, of in-depth information. So thank you all for joining the webinar and we will see you next week. Uh, same time, same place for our next webinar. So thanks so much and have a good evening. Thank you all.